Hi guys. Okay, so we're going to try something new today because um, I could not come into campus this morning. Um, and so we're going to do lecture by video. So what we're going to talk about today is how genes are regulated in bacteria. On Thursday, we'll talk about how gene regulation um, happens in eukaryotes. And so today, let's get started. Um, Oh, you know what? Before we get started, I actually have a couple announcements. So we changed our final exam location to Phillips Hall B156. Still same time, same place on Thursday, December 11th from 3 to 5 p.m. But it will not be in our usual location. It will be in Phillips Hall B156, which hopefully will afford you more space. I haven't gone and checked out that room yet. But that's the idea. Okay. Um, also, there is no seminar this week. So, no need to worry about not going to that one. Okay. So, why do organisms need to regulate gene expression at all? Um, we can think about it in two ways. We can think about it in terms of multicellular organisms, for example, us. And one obvious reason why we need to control the, you know, which genes are turned on and which genes are turned off is because every single cell contains our entire genome. And it would be no good if all genes were expressed all the time in all tissues at all stages of development. That would be really bad. And so we have switches that can turn genes on and off. And that's basically what regulation is. So some genes are expressed only in certain tissues. Some genes are expressed only at specific time points during development. Um, but there are some genes that are pretty much expressing all the time, either, um, sorry, I just noticed that I have a 15 minute limit on this. So I am going to have to record in multiple videos, 15 minute videos. Okay. So, but some, some genes are, are turned on all the time, be in pretty much in every tissue, because they're needed everywhere and they're needed all the time. And these genes are said to be constitutively expressed. Constitutively expressed. I don't think I spelled that right. Constitu. There we go. Constitutively expressed. And these are also called housekeeping genes. Um, so, this is kind of like the whiteboard in class. Okay, so um, so there are two general types of genes that we can think about. We can think about genes in terms of um, their being structural, and these genes generally make proteins, and they're involved in all kinds of metabolic functions, they're involved in general cellular processes, um, they may be actually physically structural where they are comprising um, either, you know, extracellular matrix, nuclear matrix, providing uh, literally structure, like a scaffolding in the cell or outside of the cell, or they may be um, proteins that are comprising parts of our body, like our hair, nails, things like that. Um, so those are structural genes. And then there's also regulate, regulatory genes. And these genes make proteins or RNA that are basically regulating the expression of other genes. OK. So two types of genes, structural genes and regulatory genes. Regulatory gene products regulate expression of structural genes. Um, okay, so in unicellular organisms, why would cells such as bacteria need to regulate gene expression? Well, you don't necessarily want, again, your entire genome being expressed at the same time because maybe you don't need all of those genes and that would be a waste of energy and resources to be expressing them all at the same time. So, we, um, bacteria have the ability to turn genes on and off just like we do. 
And, um, and so, for example, if a new nutrient resource became available to bacteria um, and normally they didn't use it, um, they would be able to activate those genes that are involved in the metabolic proce process, in the metabolic pathway for metabolizing that gene product, for example. So, so environmental changes um, might require bacteria to modify which genes are being expressed. All right, so there are um, a number of ways that genes can be regulated. What you're seeing here is actually um, a situation with uh, in eukaryotes, obviously, because we've got our chromatin, we've got our, it's wrapped with histones, we have introns and exons in our pre-mRNA, we've got, we have pre-mRNA, um, we have our five prime caps and our poly A tails, our RNA uh, modifications, um, and so obviously this is eukaryote, but um, gene regulation of gene expression can also occur um, at multiple levels in prokaryotes, even though they don't have necessarily as complex of kind of a hierarchy from the pathway between DNA to protein. They still um, have DNA, they have RNA, and they have protein. And you can get um, gene regulation happening at all of those levels in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Um, <clears throat> So, in prokaryotes, um, gene expression is generally um, regulated at the level of transcription. So, so in the level at the level of production of RNA, whereas eukaryotes can regulate gene expression at all of these levels. Okay, so um, gene regulation often happens um, is mediated by DNA binding proteins. And like all proteins, structure fits function, and there are certain aspects of the structure of DNA binding proteins that facilitate their function. So one um, common thing for DNA binding proteins and many types of proteins is that they have some sort of a structural motif that helps them do their job. <clears throat> and for DNA binding proteins, there are a number of recurring motifs that affect the protein structure in the region where it interacts with the DNA. And it helps um, the protein to actually fit within, usually within the major groove of the DNA double helix. So for example, here we have a helix turn helix situation where here's our, our helix, here's our helix. Here's our turn, and here's our other helix. We can have what's called zinc fingers, where we have these like funny little structures that, that interact in, again, in the major groove of the DNA. And then we can have what's called leucine zippers, where it's just a helix, and um, they're interacting via leucine amino acids along this zipper region and then it has these helices that are actually um, within the double-stranded DNA. I'm not sure how that works, but that's what they have here. Um, but these are common DNA binding motifs um, that are, are, are present in, in many um, regulator or regulatory proteins. Okay, so first clicker question. So what we're gonna do with this, because obviously you don't have your clickers, or more importantly, I don't have the clicker base. Um, and, and so what we're gonna do is just, I'm gonna let you pause it for a second so you can look at the clicker question and then I will go on and talk about what the answer is. So here, the difference between a structural gene and a regulatory gene is largely that um, structural genes encode proteins, whereas the regulatory genes control um, their products, control transcription of the structural genes. So the answer is D. Um, both structural and regulatory genes are transcribed into, are, they're, they're all transcribed. Um, whether or not they're transcribed into mRNA specifically may be up for debate. Um, 
they're often transcribed into mRNA because they often encode proteins. Structural genes don't necessarily have more complex structures. As we saw, the DNA binding proteins can have very complex structures. Um, structural genes encode proteins that function in the cellular structure. Regulatory genes carry out metabolic re reactions. Both structural genes can be actually structural and they can also carry out metabolic reactions. So the correct answer is D. Um, so moving on. So, oh, you know, I forgot to mention, with the DNA binding proteins, the way that they're inter interacting with the DNA is actually very dynamic. And, um, and what they do is they interact with a specific sequence in the DNA, which we'll see later. Um, they interact with a specific sequence and they do so in a way that's very dynamic where they're actually transiently bound to the DNA. So they, they're on and they're off, they're on and they're off, and they're kind of bouncing back and forth, um, getting on and coming off. And what this means is that there's not covalent bonding <clears throat> between the DNA and the protein. Um, it's a dynamic process and what this means is that you can get competition between, say, activator proteins that might turn a gene on and repressor proteins that might turn a gene off. And when there are, say, more repressors and activators, the repressors can outcompete the activators for that site and then turn the gene off. And so it's not necessarily like a light switch in your house. It's like basically you and your little brother fighting over the light to see who can turn it on, who can turn it off. <laughs> That's kind of how it goes. Um, and when your little brothers um, outnumber you, then maybe they'll win. And then maybe if you gang up on them with you know, some other siblings, then, then maybe you'll win, okay? So it's a very dynamic process. Okay, so in bacteria, genes are organized in groups that are controlled by a single promoter. And so there are groups of genes that are transcribed as a single unit and then cleaved to be uh, translated as separate proteins. Um, and so, for example, and these, are, these groups of genes um, are called operons. And so here we have just an example operon where we have a single promoter and then we have this oper this is the, where the RNA polymerase binds to the promoter. Then we have this operator, and the operator is a sequence in the DNA that the regulatory protein binds to. And then we have genes A, B, and C that are structural genes within the operon. Okay, so there are a couple different ways that we can characterize operons. We can um, carry, the, basically, there are two ways, two ways um, in which we can characterize operons. We can basically um, characterize them based on whether they are always on or whether they're always off. So it's basically an off versus on situation. So if they are, um, sorry, not always, but normally, if they're normally Whoops, off, for example. This means that they are what we call inducible, which is able to be turned on. Or, and then if they're normally on, we call that repressible. Okay, so these are important words, inducible, repressible. We can also, the other way that we can characterize operons is by whether or not they, their regulator, regulator is um, an activator or a repressor. So the activator, um, as you might guess, turns the gene on, turns the operon on. Excuse me. And a repressor turns the operon 